Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cornerstone. I am Pastor Amanda. I'm so glad that you tuned in today, and I want to say a special thank you to those of you who were able to join us for the moment of greeting this morning, and we had the opportunity to interact with one of our missionaries, Craig Wickstrom. Now, if you couldn't make it, that's okay, because in a few minutes, we're going to play a video that he recorded to give us just an update on who he is and what's going on with the ministry in Congo, and so you will be blessed by that. I also just wanted to mention that it is the end of the school year, and so students are wrapping up and having to do all the virtual graduation uh, things that they're doing, but we still want to honor the students in our community. So if you're a student or you have a student, if you don't mind, would you please just send an email and a picture over to welcome at cornerstonehub.org, and we will be sure that we are not missing anybody as we celebrate those accomplishments here in a couple of weeks. And uh, with that, we are going to hear from Craig. Uh, we're going to hear from Pastor Greg and we're today, and we have a really uh, special surprise for you as we wrap up our time together today. So again, thank you for joining us, and uh, we love you and miss you. Greetings, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus. My name is Craig Wickstrom. And a year ago, I was able to share with you a little bit about my story by video, about my call to serve as a liaison between the covenant churches in America and Congo. Today, I want to begin by thanking you, both as a congregation and in individually, for supporting me. I struggle with the, the need to raise adequate funding to, um, for this position, and your support has been a great encouragement to me. The Bible teaches us about our relationship with God, but it also teaches us about our relationship with others, and you have been an example of that. But that's also um, kind of makes it not too surprising that when we have um, received communication, when I have received communication from Congo in recent days, the Congolese um, individuals have expressed their concern about us. They are reading and hearing of the news here in, in the U.S. and our struggle with the coronavirus. They are concerned to hear how we are doing, and they are praying for us. In March, I made a trip to Congo to spend a month of relationship building. At that time, I arrived in Congo. I found that the country was preparing for the, for the virus, but they weren't overly concerned because they just added it to the list, to Ebola, measles, cholera, and so on. By the time I was forced to leave on March 20th, however, things had changed and um, President Chisichetti had become more concerned. He prohibited flying internationally. He prohibited um, flights domestically. He closed schools and other services, and he limited gathering sizes to more, no more than 20. Consequently, the church has struggled because they're no longer able to worship together in large groups to sing and dance and pray together. Instead, worship has moved to a family size. And um, what has happened is that the diaconate has been visiting each family on a weekly basis, and pastors have worked um, through the radio, um, radio programming. They have... Um, organized preaching and teaching, they've organized singing, they've organized prayer time, they've um, given announcements. Even um, communion has been adapted to this time where communion elements are left at the church and people are allowed to come one by one to receive the elements as they are scheduled. This pandemic is difficult for all of us around the world, and we need to be concerned about our brothers and sisters around the world. However, at the same time, we can know that they are caring about us. They are praying for us. My calling is to reinforce the relationship between the Covenant Churches in Congo and America. 
Thank you for walking alongside me. Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to be with you. My name is Pastor Greg, and we are finishing up week number three in a series on fear. But before we get to the message today, um, I just have a couple of thoughts kind of regarding what's happening in our community um, about the coronavirus and also some information about when we may be able to start up again. First of all, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I feel like when the epidemic or the pandemic began to spread and became a thing, there was a general sense of unity and solidarity with each other in our culture. But as we move towards reopening, what I've seen at least online and in different parts of the community, um, obviously there's very different perspectives on if we should be closed or not closed, what role the government should have or not have, the balance of economy and safety, and all of these questions and people are on different sides of this thing, which is great and fine. Um, but what I'm seeing is that as we're beginning to have different perspectives in our society, is that there's a demonization of people on the other side that's happening often, or a questioning of motive, and kind of these um, dividing type of, kind of just this division within our culture. And what it reminds me of is that, especially as the church, this is a powerful and important time to show our unity. And especially here at Cornerstone Covenant Church, we're a covenant church, and one of the things that has made us unique since the beginning of our founding is that we major on the majors. We focus on Jesus, his word, his mission, the power of the Holy Spirit, and we minor on the minors. And we agree to disagree on some things, and sometimes we passionately disagree. But at the end of the day, we trust in each other, we think the best of each other, we don't judge one another, and we're still brothers and sisters in Christ. And so even in our own community, we've done this really well over the years. I just want to make sure we continue to follow that way to show our unity and our diversity. Um, but also to let you know, it's not just about Cornerstone. Um, we have been meeting as pastors in the wider Turlock community. Just yesterday, we were on a meeting with 23 pastors from Turlock. And we are working together to try to figure out as the local church in Turlock, how can we work together to open around the same time and be on the same page and be unified in our approaches to how we're reopening? So those conversations are happening. And also speaking of reopening, just know that your leadership, your pastors are working as hard as possible so that we can open as soon as possible, as safe as possible, and in a way that honors our governing authorities and ultimately honors our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, right now, the name of the game is being flexible. And we make our plans, and then they change. And so right now, when we got off our Zoom meeting with the pastors the other day, we're hoping that the churches in Turlock will hopefully be able to reopen around mid-June. Now, of course, just because they open in mid-June doesn't mean it's going to look like a regular Sunday. It's actually going to take some time to make adjustments and move to the place we can have a regular worship gathering the way that we used to. But we are going to work hard to keep ministering to the church and uh, let Jesus be Jesus. So just keep your ears open. We'll keep you updated as those things happen. Um, in our county, and I will say one more thing, is we are very grateful to our county because our county has actually been proactive in working with our pastors to make a plan for churches to reopen. And actually that plan has been uh, passed on to the state and with hopes that churches can open safe and soon. So Anyways, uh, just that's a little update for you. And now let's pray, and we're going to jump into our third and last sermon on the topic of fear. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you are God. Thank you that you sit on the throne. Thank you that you hold the power of the universe in your hands. And by a spoken word, you can bring things into being. And through your breath, you can bring life. We thank you that in you, all things are held together. We thank you that you are love. And God, I thank you that there is none forgotten underneath your care. And you know every human being and you love each person. And we thank you for that. God, we thank you that you are not silent and that you continue to make yourself available. You continue to reveal your truth and your person to us today. And God, ultimately, we, we come to know you more this morning. And so, Lord, just pray that you would, you would meet each person in this time according to what you want to do in their lives. And Lord, I submit my heart and myself to you. 
And I humbly ask that you would direct this sermon and the message this morning and allow me to speak what you want me to speak with the heart you want me to have. And so we just thank you right now. So Lord, pray this in your name. God's people said, amen. All right. As I said, we are on the last week in our sermon series on fear. And fear is a, you know, Fear is a natural and a normal part of the human existence, right? We all have fear. You have it and I have it. And the thing is, God wants to grow us through our fear. And when Jesus walked on this earth, he had 12 disciples. And his plan was that he was going to prepare them for the day when he would ascend to heaven and he would essentially give them his mission and spread the good news of the gospel to the world and to show the world what God is like. And one of the most important things that he wanted to teach his disciples uh, about was about fear. And there was a progression of his teachings. And actually, the first, uh, the first teaching really about fear that we looked at together was a few weeks ago. And this was the famous scene when Jesus was on the boat with his disciples. Jesus had fallen asleep. A huge storm came and they thought they were going to die. The disciples were terrified. And they wake up Jesus and with the spoken word, Jesus calms everything. And the scriptures say, a little bit to our surprise, is that after Jesus comes everything, the scriptures don't say, and now the disciples were at peace and they were no longer afraid. No, the scripture said, but after that, they feared a great fear because their fear of Jesus was bigger than their fear of the storm because Jesus was teaching them that his power was greater than any other power. And they left that conversation just in awe and amazement. And they asked the question, who is this man? No one's ever seen anybody like Jesus. Now, when they get to the shore, they actually get an answer to that question. Because when the disciples and Jesus get to the shore, a demon-possessed man shows up to greet them. And of course, this is a, this is a powerful, uh, powerful man because there's many demons inside of him. And when Jesus shows up, the demons, they actually know Jesus because they have, they have some spiritual wisdom. I shouldn't say wisdom. They have some spiritual insight because they've known Jesus from another realm and they know what's going to happen in the final judgment and where this thing is going. But when they encounter Jesus, they begin to beg Jesus that Jesus basically would be merciful to them because they know his power. Now what Jesus does is he, he exercises the demons from this man bringing freedom and wholeness and new life. And he sends the demons into a herd of pigs. And these pigs go off the cliff and they, they go off into the water. Now, in this moment of deliverance, Jesus delivers the man. He also delivers the whole community because this man has been a nuisance for years and years. And so once again, you would expect that after the deliverance, there would be peace in the city. But the same thing happened to the townspeople that happened to the disciples. And they came to Jesus, and instead of being grateful and at peace, the scriptures say they were terrified. Like the disciples, they feared a great fear because they saw that the power of Jesus was great. His power was greater than the power even of this demon-possessed man. But this was the lesson that Jesus wanted to show the disciples when they saw the power of Jesus, instead of gratitude and drawing near to Jesus, the people of the town came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, we want you to get out of here. They saw his power and wanted to put as much space as possible between them and between Jesus because they didn't understand the nature of his power. It's a good lesson the disciples need to hear because when people don't understand who God really is and who Jesus truly is, they won't want to be close to him. But one of the great tasks that Jesus gave his disciples and gave to us is to proclaim the good news that God so loved the world and God is powerful, but God is also love and we are invited to draw near to him. Now, when the disciples sail back to the other side of the shores with Jesus, Jesus does a couple things, and then they come together, and Jesus has a mission conversation with them. 
And he basically reminds them and says, hey guys, here's the deal. You are going to go out and you are going to do what I've been doing. You're going to heal people and you're going to proclaim the good news. But just so you know, there's going to be opposition and people are going to talk about you. They're going to tear you down. They're going to even try and torture you. Some of you are going to die on behalf of the good news of the gospel. But have no fear because in the midst of all of this, don't forget what God thinks about you. And this is what Jesus said to them. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. So no matter what happens, Jesus reminds them, you are not only valuable to yourself. You are like, well, you're not just valuable to yourself. You are valuable to God. In fact, you're infinitely more valuable to God. He even knows the hairs on your head. So don't be afraid of the people who can even take your life because it's God above who determines your eternal destiny. But just remember, he loves you and he cares for you. Now, after this conversation, uh, we now move to the next, the last part of our field trip on fear. And I love this story because in this story, we kind of see Jesus bring the whole thing together in a really kind of a neat way. So let's jump into the text this morning. We're in Matthew chapter 14, um, verses 22 and 23 is where we're going to start. And here's what it says. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. Okay, picture this scene a second. The first time Jesus took the disciples on the water to teach them about fear, it says that Jesus got in the boat and the disciples followed him. But see, now they've been with Jesus for a little bit longer and they know some things about Jesus. Jesus is continuously, continuously putting them in situations to grow them deeper and wider. And this time, Jesus puts them on a boat, but he's not going to be there. So they're already thinking, uh-oh, what does he have in mind? And what's really kind of funny, remember the first time they followed him? This time on the water, Jesus made the disciples get on the boat. The Greek word here is the word um, anenkazo, which basically means to compel somebody or to force somebody to do something. And I can see where Jesus would have to do this, right? I mean, they're probably suffering a little uh, PSD, uh, PTSD from the first time on the water. And Jesus is getting them on the water again. And this time he's not going to go with them. So if the storm comes down, this time, what are they going to do when Jesus isn't in the boat? So Jesus has to make them get on the boat. I can just see this scene. Jesus is like, hey, get on the boat. They're like, uh-uh. He's like, uh-huh, get on the boat. Uh-uh, not get on that boat. You're getting on the boat. Did you see what I did to that demon back there? And they get on the boat finally. Now, I don't know if that's how it went. You can make up your own scene, but that's how it goes in my head. So anyways, they get on the boat. And they take off to the water and the story goes on like this. It says, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So it's not a storm like the first scene, but there's, there's some big waves, there's some big wind, and they're having to paddle and work really hard to get through this thing. And then it says, shortly before dawn, before the sun comes up, Jesus went out to them and he was walking on the lake. And let's go to the next slide. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. So they didn't know it was Jesus and whatever it was they saw terrified them. And then it goes on, but Jesus immediately said to them, and I love this line, this line close to you, we're going to use it over and over, take courage, take courage, it is I. 
don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. So, once they knew it was Jesus, everything was okay in their minds. And there was a mental switch. Why? Because at this point of the story, they've seen the power of Jesus. Jesus has testified about his love for them. And so in the midst of the storm, once they see Jesus, they say, it's going to be okay. But what's really neat and so fascinating to me is Peter now takes the next step in regards to fear. And it's actually maybe the step that God is calling us to take too as we talk about fear. Jesus sees, or Peter sees Jesus and he says, Jesus, I want to come out to you. Can I come to you? Now, I don't know. I don't know exactly what was going on in Peter's mind. I mean, if you think about it, it's still dark outside. There's waves and there's wind. And it's probably not a very safe time to step out of the boat. It's probably a really dumb time to step out on the boat onto the water. But there's something inside of Peter that's driving him and calling him to go out to Jesus. Now, there's different ideas about this. I've, I've thought about this a lot over the years because this scene just amazes me. And I can really come down to pretty much three reasons why I can see Peter getting out of the boat. And as a good preacher, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to summarize those three reasons uh, with P's. I'm going to say it's p- about power and presence and passion. The first reason I think that he wants to go out to Jesus has to do with the idea of power. Now, I understand this personally in my own life. It was in college when I really began to take my faith in Jesus very seriously. And I realized that I wanted to give my life to him and follow him in everything that I did. And so I began to study his word and to meet in fellowship and to share the good news with the people around me and to live for him in all that I did. And I had this, um, outside of my college dorm, there was a little hill and I went down to the stream and it was kind of my devotion place. I'd go there every morning to pray and to read and then the stream would be going by. And I literally remember reading this story and thinking, I love Peter, he wants to be like Jesus and he wanted to experience the power of Jesus. And I was at a place, I wanted to experience the power of Jesus. And I thought if Peter could walk on water, if his faith was strong enough, then maybe I can walk on water. I literally put my Bible down and I said, God, I have the faith. And I took a step into that stream. And guess what? I fell right into the water. Now, there's all these other issues about faith and and questions around that whole scene. But at the heart of it, Or part of it was that I just wanted to experience the power of God in my life. And I think that's part of what's happening in Peter. He wants to step out and experience the power of God in his life. Now, the second thing that I think is going on too is he also wanted to experience the presence of God in his life. You can think about it this way. I I think part of what's, you know, in these stories, the disciples are remembering what has happened in their previous situations. Remember, the people of the city, when Jesus delivered the man from the demons, They didn't understand who he was. And so because of that, they wanted to get away from Jesus. But when we come to this scene, we see that Peter is beginning to really understand who Jesus is, his power and also his love. And as Peter gets to know Jesus, Peter is just drawn to God. And he's drawn to, or he's drawn to Jesus, who is God, by the way. And he just wants to get close to Jesus. So I think part of what's going on is he sees, wow, this is Jesus and his glory. I want to know more. I want to be with Jesus. So he wants to step out of the boat and to go to Jesus. Now, the third reason I think that could be driving him is the idea of passion. And to understand this reason, we have to know a little bit about the culture that they grew up in. Remember, Jesus had these 12 disciples who followed him wherever he went. Now, these disciples, they were students of a teacher They wanted to know everything Jesus had to teach them, but it was more than that. They also wanted to be like Jesus in every way. You see, in their culture, they had a kind of an interesting uh, system with rabbis and disciples. And in the Jewish culture, rabbis were highly esteemed individuals. And it was their job to interpret the Old Testament. They called it Torah. And then to pass on that interpretation to their disciples 
So the teaching would live on through the generations. Now, these rabbis, as they sought to pass on the tradition, they wouldn't choose just anybody. They chose the best of the best, the brightest, and the most dedicated, those who had the biggest potential to do what they did, to be their disciples and to follow them around. And so when little Jewish boys were born, most Jewish boys would go to some sort of Torah school and they would learn the Old Testament. Many of them would memorize even the entire first five books of the Bible. And they had different levels of education. And if you were uh, the best and the brightest, you'd go on to the next level and then on to the next level. And then finally, at the top of all of it, when you kind of finish your education, you would basically apply to be a disciple of a rabbi. And so you'd go, you'd interview with a rabbi. And if the, the rabbi thought, man, this, this kid has got it. He, he has what he needs to be like me and to pass on my interpretation of the Bible. That rabbi would choose those disciples and those disciples would literally devote the rest of their lives to following the rabbi around wherever he went. They were the best of the best and wherever the rabbi went, they would go too. There was a phrase they used to use or a blessing they would give to disciples that said, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Basically saying, may you be so close to every movement of your rabbi that the dust they kick up from their sandals would cover you. They were extraordinary people, the best of the best of the best. Now, you may know something about the disciples of Jesus. They don't strike you as the best of the best kind of people. They have all sorts of issues and they're not always the brightest bulb in the box of light bulbs or whatever you'd want to say. And even when we see Jesus choose them, he doesn't choose them from schools. He actually chooses fishermen and tax collectors. And one of the things that always kind of strikes me in these stories, you wonder, why is it that these fishermen would leave their jobs like that to follow Jesus? Well, Jesus was a rabbi. And the fact they were doing the family business means that they were not the best of the best and they were not chosen to follow a rabbi. But when Jesus comes along and says, follow me, they're blown away. They drop everything to follow Jesus. Jesus takes ordinary men and ordinary women and he uses them, which is good news for, I think, most of us who wouldn't consider ourselves the best of the best or the brightest or have everything. We're ordinary people, and that's who Jesus uses. So Peter, wanting to know the power of Jesus and wanting to be in the presence of Jesus and having the passion to be like Jesus, he sees Jesus on the water, and Peter says, Jesus, let me come out to you, and here's how it goes. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water and came towards Jesus. He actually did it. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. See what happened? When his eyes were on Jesus, he was able to step out and do what he was meant to do. But the minute he took his eyes off of Jesus and he focused on the problems and the wind and the waves, he became afraid. Now, one of the things that I love about this story and I love about how Jesus interacts with his disciples on a regular basis, Jesus knows that we're all growing and that there's, and what happens when we fall, Jesus doesn't just turn his back and he doesn't just reject us and say, you weren't good enough. You weren't smart enough. You didn't have a lot of faith. Look at you. I'll go find other disciples. You know what Jesus does every single time? He puts out his hand when we call his name and he lifts us back up again and he gives us another chance. I love that about Jesus. But you know what I also love about Jesus? When he lifts us up to give us another opportunity, he still speaks to us the truth and tells us what we need to hear. And he talks to Peter and he says, well, let me go back. Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You, you of little faith, he said, why 
did you doubt? It's what Peter needed to hear in that moment. It's to recognize as much as he grew in his trust and he worked through his fear, there was still room for improvement. Now, last week, actually two weeks ago, I got a phone message from my friend Ann Alam who listened to the first sermon on fear. And she said to me, she said, you know, it's a great sermon on fear. She says, but one of the things I've learned about fear is that you don't really know what fear is until you have to fear for your children. I've been thinking a lot about that phrase over the last couple of weeks. And she's so right. I mean, let's think about maybe something that's not as important or serious as your children. Um, let's say that you bought a really nice car or you restored a car and it's really valuable to you. Well, when the kids in your home or the kids down the street start driving their scooters next to your car, you start to freak out a little bit because if they fall, they could scratch your car or they could put a dent into it. And so what happens is you, have a, you, you hold this fear for this car you have because we fear for the things that are most valuable to us and even more so when we have children because when you value your children and you love your children one of the greatest fears is that something would happen to them that would be detrimental to them i remember this is the time in my life i was more afraid than any other moment and it happened when ruby our daughter was a little tiny girl starting to walk And we're always so careful around the swimming pool. There's always an adult, always floaties. Like we are on target. And this one time we're we're finishing up swimming at our grandpa and grandma's house. And we literally stepped away. We turned our backs for probably like 10 seconds. And when we turned around, I didn't see Ruby, but I could see her head under the water. And you better believe I responded so fast. I don't even know. I wasn't even thinking. I jumped in the water. I grabbed her and I brought her out of the water And once she's breathing in okay, I was shaking. I was so afraid because I feared for that little girl because she was so valuable to me. And here's part of the lesson from the series on fear. You are so valuable to God. God fears for your safety. He fears for your health. And he literally will do anything for you because he wants what's best for you. And you are his son and you are his daughter. God loves you so much. And that is a huge lesson of the cross that we have to continue to remember. The reason that we're given for the cross, John three sixteen, the classic scripture, for God so loved, God so loved the world God loved every person in the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in Jesus shall not perish, but they will have eternal life. God has gone the distance. He's gone the distance for you. He became a person. He walked on this earth. He laid his life down. He allowed himself to die on a cross. And by dying on that cross, he absorbed the sins of the world so that when he died, the power of sin could die too. And when he, after he died, he rose again for the dead to show that even after death, there is now new life because sin and death has lost its hold on everything. And so we are invited to trust what Jesus has done is true and to experience the freedom that we can have in Jesus Christ. And so the message that Jesus has for us this morning is to take courage for it is I. Jesus showed the disciples his power. He showed them his love. And now he says, now take courage and do what you are called and meant to do. And of course, this was a process and a cycle, right? Because that's what life is. Jesus has always taken us through the different movements of growth. Now you can think about growing through fear. And sometimes like week number one, What we need to see in God is we just need to be aware and recognize the true power that he has. 
And we need to fear a great fear and just see that his power makes anything else actually powerless. And we need to know that. Sometimes in that movement, we come to a place in our lives where we may know his power, but we need to know his love because we need to understand that he's for us so that we aren't compelled not to get away from him, but to come near to him. Because sometimes in the power of Jesus, and he teaches us, it does hurt. Some of the lessons do hurt, but in his love, we can know that we can still draw near because in the end, God is working for us and he's not against us. But fear is more than just knowing who God is. Fear is then also taking the next step to do what God has called us to do. It's learning to then trust in the power of Jesus. Take courage, for it is I. And God is always working those movements in our lives to showing us his power and his love and then inviting us to take the next step, to take courage, for it is I. Him. And so in your own life, as you think about what to do with the message today, I would encourage you this. Maybe the one thing you need to ask is, you know, what, what movement am I in right now? Maybe right now, God wants you to see his power and, and you've been forgetting how powerful he is. Or maybe you need to know his love because you've lost sight of there's a God who is so for you and he's so behind you. Or maybe, maybe right now you know things, but you're in the boat. And Jesus is saying, take courage. It is I. Come out to me. Do what you're called to do. And maybe you've been just staying on the sidelines because you're afraid if I do this, I might fail. If I say this, people might not like me. If I make this sacrifice, maybe I won't have enough resources for myself. And, and maybe you've been afraid and maybe God now is saying, I want you to step out and do what you're meant to do. And if you're wondering, what are you supposed to do? Um, sometimes those things are specific and it's to start a ministry or it's to take on a certain job or to have a role as a parent or whatever that is. And, but they're also broad. There's things that we're always called to do. We're always like the disciples. Um, we're always called to step out and to be like Jesus. We're always called to step out and wherever Jesus puts us, we get to be bearers of the good news that Jesus loves the world and Jesus is for you and invite people to put their trust in Jesus. So what is God asking you to do as he takes you through a journey of fear? Now, the journey on the disciples that Jesus takes the disciples through is a really encouraging journey because you do see their growth. And even in all the missteps of the disciples, what happens after Jesus leads them through um, his death and resurrection, and they're, they truly see his power in a new and whole way when Jesus rises from the dead, we see that when the disciples know his power and love, those disciples become fearless. And Peter himself has learned now to take courage after Jesus has gone to heaven. And this is one of my favorite lines in the Bible. It's from Acts chapter 14. And what happens is Peter's preaching basically like the first sermon after Jesus goes to heaven. And the religious leaders don't like this because they're not a fan of people following Jesus. So the religious leaders of the Jewish people, they get Peter and they begin to question Peter. And I love Peter. He's talking about them. And he says, listen, I do all the things that I do. I speak in the name of Jesus. And by the way, you're the people who crucified him. But Jesus did raise himself from the dead. And he has power. And there is salvation found in only Jesus alone. And this was the response of the people when they heard Peter. I love this. And when they saw the courage hate courage. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized, check this out, they were unschooled and ordinary men. They weren't the best of the best. They didn't have all the training. They weren't the smartest people. They weren't those people we look at when, you know how there's some people, you look at them, you're like, man, they're so good at so many things. I wish I was like them. They're not like those people. These are unschooled and ordinary men, but they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Because ordinary men and ordinary women become astonishing people when they are with Jesus and they learn to keep their eyes on Jesus. Jesus didn't choose the best of the best to be his disciples on purpose. He wanted all of us to know that anybody can follow Jesus and anybody can live an astonishing life when they're with Jesus and when they learn to 
keep their eyes on Jesus. So as you go this morning, in just a few moments, we are going to worship together, and I'm so excited to worship with Sue, and so I encourage you just to join us in song. Um, but as you go this week, I just want you to take courage and think about the steps that God is calling you to take in your life, and then don't be afraid. He has power, and he has love, and he's totally for you. So with that, let's pray, and we'll worship together. God in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your power, and we thank you for your love. And we thank you that even as so many people throughout human history, and even today, have been unsure about your power or unsure about your love, we thank you, Jesus, that you have made it abundantly clear that the power is yours and the love is yours, and all glory belongs to you. So Lord, I pray that that truth would sink deep into our hearts and into our souls. And we would be like Peter and learn to be fearless and take the steps you're asking each of us to take. God, would you show each of us the steps you want us to take? And would you fill us with your power, your presence, and your Holy Spirit to do what you're calling us to do? And to you be all the honor and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Grace and peace. Good morning, friends. My name is Sue Bonander, and I have the privilege of sharing music with you this morning. I'm going to start by reading a little bit of Psalm 100, which speaks about singing. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come into his presence with singing. And that's what we're going to do now. Come into his presence and sing joyfully as we praise him. Um, and I'm going to imagine you at home sitting on your couch or wherever you are and singing with me because it's much more fun to sing together than all alone. We're going to start with a song called Trust in the Lord with All Your Heart written by Rick Carlson. It's from Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. And uh, Some of you may not know it. It's been a while since we've sung it. Um, we're singing it twice so if you don't know it hop in on the second time around. remember to trust in him and not our own plans. If we trust in him, there's no need for fear. So in continuing with that trust theme, the next one we're going to sing is Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. It's been rearranged by Casting Crowns and remember to sing joyfully. Here we go. Jesus. 
Cornerstone. The last song we're going to do together is The Benediction, also written by Rick Carlson. And I like this one because when we're together, sometimes we split the church in two and one half will turn to the right, the other half will turn to the left, and we sing each other out um, after a wonderful worship service. So I'm going to imagine you singing to each other wherever you are. If you're alone, um, Look in the mirror. I don't know. This is great. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. Let's do it. See you soon.